This is one of those retention, perseverance, going to keep going. And so I think this testimony, you know, is, is highlighting what God can do through that, that perseverance. Let's talk a little jail. <laughs> so it's been wild, right, Gar? So we open the, we, the guys are coming in and through the doors like regular. And there's this one guy to start the meeting. He's, he walks in arrogant. He's like, oh, I feel just lazy and fat. I just, I just ate a lot. And, and, he goes, and he sits down. And I go, and Gary goes, hey, brother, what's up? And he goes, eh, same. So I go, um, well, you're welcome to stay. There's going to be dessert if you like. And it's not going to be dessert that you're thinking, but <laughs> there's going to be dessert. So uh, he leaves half, halfway through. He's like, yeah, I got to uh, go find somebody. So he leaves. So I'm like, oh, his loss. But um, Gary opens the meeting. It was powerful. He spoke about kingdom realities, right? And it was a perfect setup. Like, Gary and I, we don't even tell each other what we're ministering on. It's just like, once we meet in the parking lot, after I'm waiting 10 minutes for him, um, I go, so Gar, what's on, what's on your heart? What's God speaking to you? And he says, it says, blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, he's speaking the same to me, so we're going to piggyback off each other. So that's how it works with us. So he opens the meeting, and it's the perfect setup. And he introduces me, and um, I get up there, and I'm like, guys, let's Let's just shut the world off right now. Just shut everything off. Like, shut the earth off. Like, close your eyes and let's focus on God solely. Let's make room for God, what God has tonight. Because I felt something when my wife was praying for me every time I'd leave for jail. She just, oh, it's just like, we join our faith together and it's beautiful. And she, she's just like, she's so prophetic. And she tells me my message. So, um, so I'm doing that, and I, I, I want to focus on the mind for them to get ready to receive what's going to happen at the end, because I knew something, a shift was happening. So, um, I, as they're, they're, they're so responsive, right, Gary? So I say, close your eyes, they're all bowing their heads, and they're like shutting the world off, and I say, I command all voices to leave this facility right now. And focus solely on you right now, Father. So everybody's in it right now. And so I, I preach on Colossians 3, where it says, relocate yourself mentally. And uh, focus on the, the throne room realities where you're co-seated in Christ Jesus. So I keep on preaching on that, on things, set your minds not on earthly, but on heavenly. Set your minds not on things that are below, but from above. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm preaching on. I'm, I'm trying to, and the, they're engaging with us, and the, they're in it. I'm like, all right, God, I know where you're going with this, because at the end, something, I know it, I know it's going to happen. So at the end, you know, we're like, I'm like, all right, guys, let's, let's please stand. So everybody's standing, and um, I said, Gary, there's a Kleenex right there. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, now, everybody's standing, and I go, lift your hands to God right now. And everybody's responsive. They lift their, their hands to God. And I said, tonight's the night of testimony. Tonight's the night we leave all the lies behind. Tonight, you're going to go in your cell. When you leave this, these doors, you're going to be in peace, and God's going to give you dreams. And you're gonna be, your mind is going to be set free. So... We're praying for them, and I see these two guys in the corner in the, in the spirit. So I go up to them, and I go, do you want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit right now? And they go, yeah. So I put my, as soon as I put my hand on their chest, they start speaking in tongues, both of them at the same time. I'm like, yeah, I knew this was powerful, God. And then the, another guy at the end, like, he was swaying with me. I was like, please don't fall, because then the correction officer is going to come in, and they think it's a riot, and I'm going to be pinned on the floor, and then, but uh, no, the fruit that's coming out of this ministry, it's, no one knows because they can't be with us.
but it's so powerful with the movement that's got that God is doing in there. So powerful. Just keep us in prayers. I know you, we love that you guys pray for us and just keep on doing it because God's moving. Powerful. So good. And yeah, I know like with Frank has told me, when you get the training to go in, like you're you're discouraged from physically touching the inmates. But we were actually just speaking about how there's nothing in the word of God that really would encourage you to follow that rule. And so if he felt like you've got to lay hands and get that person baptized in the spirit, but in the back of his mind he's thinking, oh, I'm I'm scared of breaking the rules or something's going to go wrong, he might have missed that opportunity. But he just, he saw it through, and I, I admire that very much that he, he did so. Um, but yeah, just realize there's, there's things happening all around, you know, outside of just these meetings, um, jail ministry, basic, young adults, teen group, children's ministry. Honestly, there's children in children's ministry, what, a month ago, getting, giving their lives to the Lord, you know, within the past month or two. You just, you, almost, you don't know how many things are happening all the time outside of these meetings. And so it's good to just hear from that, from, from those people from time to time. But that said, kids are released. And I want to welcome up Pastor Chris. We are blessed. Uh, we had him on Sunday and we've got him again tonight. The revolution starts with one life. He said, I am a part of the revolution. I am a part of the revolution. Now, if you haven't been here long, I don't know if you figured it out yet, but there's a different sound coming out of this house. It is unique. I have to say it is unique. But it's about 2,000 years old. <laughs> well, all we've decided to do is get rid of the man-made stuff, get rid of all the jargon, church jargon through the years. It has clouded up the process and gone back to the original Word of God, I'm talking about the Greek and the Hebrew, and study into what the original uh, writers had to say. And so we've been preaching that instead of all the things that have come through the years. Um, I don't believe in the early church fathers. I believe they're the early church philosophers. So, you know, when you start... People start saying, well, the early church fathers, they did the Nicene Creed, they did all these things. Yeah, they're the ones that clouded up the mess. They're the ones that caused, extracted ideas from what the apostles taught rather than teach what the apostles taught. So we want to teach what the apostles taught, not some abstract idea that people years later decided that they must have met. And I've noticed the clarification of that inside of our hearts, what it does is it brings about a true passion, it brings about a higher meaning, it brings about a pure life, it brings about a consistent devotion inside the believers who take it. Um, And I remind you that Jesus said, there's nobody who's drunk new wine who immediately says, I like the new wine, but they say I prefer the old better. Jesus said that. So he's saying what you're used to is what you prefer. So I'm not ignorant of that. And I realize that if you've been trained in some of the old lingo, when I start taking you back to the original lingo, it might challenge you. But I just challenge you with this one thing. If the Bible doesn't say it, I don't say it. Okay? So if the Bible says it, you got to give up your spot. you got to give up your thought. you got to give up that position. And so Jesus made a statement, and I hope you'll make it too. He said, my doctrine is not my own. Do you have your own doctrine? Not even Jesus had his own doctrine. He says, but it's him who sent me. I say what he says. I teach what he taught. I declare what he declares. And so that's what we want to do. Okay, so tonight, um, in keeping with... uh, these Wednesday nights about spirit activity and spirit life. Uh, of course, there's the word and there's the spirit. And so we've been focusing a little bit more on the spirit life, upon the spirit intervention into our lives. 
And, you know, Mark and Amy had to go tonight um, to uh, Ava's college is giving away grant money. So they said if we go, we can collect her some money. So they went to the dinner and <laughs> go get Ava some grant money. I got the meeting. So here we are. And uh, it's been a while since I've had a chance to teach on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so I'd like to do that tonight. So if you like the anointing, you probably want to sit right there, close. <laughs> um, but if you want to get touched, because I think that at the end of this, <laughs> there's going to be a touch. There's going to be a touch that comes. So I got this whiteboard. Thank you, Dan, for supplying our needs. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration before I even read the scriptures so that kind of bring us all on the same page. So, oh, black and yellow over there. Okay, so um, if we can use a simple diagram. So God is a three-faceted being, amen? Spirit, soul, body. So God, 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 he made us in his image and his likeness, and we are spirit, soul, and body as well. The reason that we are made in the image and likeness of God, it just means there's three facets to him, there's three facets to us, and, and so you just have to understand what, if you want to understand about God, you can, the best example you can have is to look at man. There's nothing in the earth that will tell you more about God than man. Not his sins, not his problems, but we're talking about man absent of sin, absent of all of his problems is the best example. Jesus was the ultimate example of the Father. In fact, he was so like the Father that he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so it says in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that he is the exact image and likeness of God. So image and likeness is not the thing it reflects. It's exactly like it. So you have to understand Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is the Son. And he's exactly like the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen him. I'm his image. I am his image. Okay? So he says, I'm bearing in my body his spiritual DNA. His nature, his likeness is in me. Um, so if you understand that, it'll help you understand a lot of things about Jesus Christ and therefore a lot of things about God. But he was the perfect example of the Father. So we have talked in the past about the fact that if you take a man's spirit out of him, just this part here, right, and we blow it up, that there's two parts to spirit. Man, all men were made to be cohabited. Do you understand it? It's important to understand your spirit is not alone. It never has been alone. You either had the spirit of God in you or you had the spirit of sin inside of you, the nature of sin. One or the other. So inside of everybody's spirit is, you could say, me or you. And then there was originally from Adam the nature of sin. So I'm not saying it was half and half. I'm just showing you that there's two parts. Okay, so this combined, if you mixed, you know, two things together, shook it up, it'd be more like that than like this, okay? So but it's the nature of sin... In, it says in what is it, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, sin entered the world, and then death through sin. So death has to do with the fact that you become unconscious of God. It's not you lay down and stop breathing. To, the, the, God said in the day that you eat the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die. That day, Adam continued to live, but yet he died. His spirit was cut off from God, so much so, God said, Adam, where are you? So God is here looking at, let's say this is Adam now, and Adam has entered into a prison cell of sin. 
And God could no longer identify him in the spirit because he wasn't where God is. And God wasn't within him. And so God had to rescue man from the nature of sin in his spirit. So this is really important stuff. If you can understand what happened to you, it'll make a lot more sense for you. So what happens is that everybody has a spirit, and in everybody's spirit is where all the potential is of the greatest, the greatest things that you could ever achieve in your life. Your greatest potential lies right here. That's where the creative factor of God, that's where the power of God, that's where the amazing ability of God resides. But when sin came, entered the world, and it dislodged the purpose of God and brought darkness into the spirit of man. So man fell in his spirit, not his body, not in his soul, in his spirit. He was cut off from God. But then the outward effect of that is darkness permeated the whole man. And so when you think about it, when you become like this, you're no longer being led by God from within. You are now reacting to external forces which are training you. So whatever I experience outside touches my soul and my spirit confirms the darkness and therefore this negative black world, unforgiveness, sin, cravings, all kinds of dimensions of wickedness happen. So there's something that happened. I know we're talking about sin right now, but I want you to know that when Jesus Christ came, it says he circumcised our heart and Christ is in us. Okay. So something has drastically changed. When Christ comes, he drives out the nature of sin. You no longer have the nature of sin. You are now a child of God and his spirit is sharing occupancy in your spirit and that's the power of salvation you're born from above the seed of god's coming to you and it's dislodged the sinful nature you no longer are a slave to sin slavery to sin had ended when you received christ you say yeah well well, then why do i still sin well that's because you're dumb (laughs) i mean dumb as an ignorant to the things of god Right. The more you understand what he did, the less you'll put up with acting like something you're not. Right. If I think I'm a sinner, I will sin. Right. As a man thinks, so is he. So you have to think right. You have to know what has happened to you. If you don't know what's happened to you, you'll keep acting like something you're not. You know, it's, it's the old adage, like if you, well, I can use this example that if someone told you there's a big hairy monster in your closet, Every time you go to bed, I don't care if you're 50 or 60, (laughs) the big hairy monster's in the closet, you know. So you've got this lie in your head. You're going to hear sounds. You're going to hear scratching. People believe in haunted houses. Spirits don't dwell in houses. They dwell in people. Spirit doesn't want to be in your house or in a piece of wood. It wants to be in your body. Jesus, could we go into the pigs? Good option, demons. Pretty smart, knowing that the Jews don't eat the pork. Go ahead. Go for it. And so the demons wanted a body because they can't function outside of a body. There's not a lot they can do. So Jesus came, Christ in us, and then he took away the prison cell and reinvigorated us, and now we live from the inside out. You understand? We are no longer guided by externalism. We are guided through internal reaction of the Father. So before you were saved, you'd pray to God. Now that you're saved, you pray in union with him. You don't have to stop and get on your knees to pray, although that's nice sometimes. You don't have to go into a closet. You have to enter your prayer closet, which is your spirit man. You could be talking to me, and I could be busy praying and have done it many times. Like, oh, God, please have them stop talking. (laughs) You know, or whatever. Uh, But (laughs) you understand that the closet just means the hidden place where him and I are in union. The Bible says pray without. That means don't stop. If it's on the knee thing, you're not going to work anymore, you're not paying your bills anymore, you're not doing anything anymore. But if praying without ceasing means you're in the inner place and you're in constant communion with God and you walk with him and he walks with you and you do life together, that means he's guiding you and leading you continuously and constantly. Right? Okay. 
One more thing. I've got to give you one more thing here. Uh, I'm thinking of how I'm going to show you. All right. It's an interesting thing. Um, I'm just going to draw another one. All right. So here's you. And now uh, there's you. And there's the Spirit of God. Okay? So the Spirit of God comes into you, or Christ comes into you, and you have this new force of life inside you. So what is interesting, and people don't often think about it, is what language does the Spirit speak? What happened before there was English? All right, so let's say this is the spirit realm. And this is the natural. Well, over here, they speak spirit language. And over here, could be Italian, could be English. English came way later, right? <laughs> could be Greek, could have been Armenian, right? Could have been all different languages. So men in the natural speak a language. But before there were any languages, because all this came at Babel, there was a language. And it wasn't English. And it wasn't Spanish. Well, that just, and it wasn't Chinese. There, that's 95% of all languages. It wasn't any of that. So it was a tongue of heaven. It was the language, I call it this. Am I spelling that right? Elohim. Elohim. So that's God. The language of Elohim. That's actually in the Bible. That there's the language of Elohim. The language of God is what they were speaking. So before man was created, the angels and God were talking, and they were speaking a certain language. Right? right? And you got to know this. Because it, it dethrones the strangeness of speaking in tongues. Because when the Spirit of God came into you, the language of God became available to you. He understands you in every language. But it sure is good speaking in the homeland language. Are you with me? Okay, now it's exciting when you think about the potential of this. So, all right, ready? Moko sekete, misaka, lobo seke. Okay? The angels are going, can me, me, pick me. <laughs> they, want to, they want to tell you what it means. They want to reveal it. If we could understand the raw reality of the spirit language and what it means... We would use it far more than we use. Because all it is, is the, it's our language of our homeland. Uh, Tom, what, you're from Ukraine, right, originally? Or where? where no, you, no where, was, where was your home? Like, like, did you move from another country or no? Who was I talking to? Oh, yeah, there he is. I'm sorry. It was Alex. Yeah, Alex. You're from Ukraine, right. Sorry. See, I just misfigured you and <laughs> placed you. So what was your language there? Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Wow, isn't it amazing? <laughs> <laughs> so does it feel good to you when someone speaks to you in your home language? Yeah. Why? Like Resonate. Feels natural. Yeah. Guess what? When you finally understand what speaking in tongues is, it'll resonate with you. Yeah. And it will feel natural. 
because it's your home language. It's our spirit language. It's where our father's from. It's how he communicates. When he talks to the angels, he doesn't say, hey, you guys. <laughs> they speak in the heavenly language, the language of Elohim, the eternal God. That's exciting. So this is, we could call it pre babel language. Now it's after babel language. So I'm not suggesting you give up your homeland language. Oh, I know why I thought you are from Ukraine, because you guys are friends. Yeah, right? And that you help you found here. Um, I'm thinking, where did I get that? <clears throat> All right. Yes. Right. You started down a path briefly about why do I still sin and because you don't you're not yet convinced of who you are. Right. Can you kind of clarify the the idea that, you know, you partially why that all doesn't fall off is because your soul realm is still yeah. trained in the old way. Yeah. Because I really feel like for me, tongues was the key of retraining that whole thing. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Did you hear what he said? Everybody hear him? Uh, Pastor Jerry was saying how, you know, when I was set free from sin, and yet people sin, and so you're like, well, why do I still sin? And he was saying how, well, it's because your soul was trained in the old man. That's where all those scriptures, like, put off the old man, put on the new. It's talking about the conduct of the old man, the training. It's the perpetual, continual, sinful nature in you in your life, and then all of a sudden you come to Christ, and you're like, yeah, how, how do I live this? And so um, <clears throat> what I, I'll show you one example that might help you see it. Um, so we're going to remove this as from God because he doesn't sin. <laughs> okay, so this will be a man now, okay? So when the sinful nature was in me, it gave me no guidance. So everything was, like I said, external coming in. And so that would train my, the external things I, I faced through the training of the sinful nature was experiential. So my soul, so you got all these creases in your soul, like your brain, you know, they're experiential moments in your life. You learned this happens and that happens, this happens and that happens, and this happens and that happens. And you know what you're like. And then Christ comes inside, changes your heart, and now... Each of these experiences have to be confronted with truth. So the truth of God's word knocks that out, which then trains your body to do different, and then the, act, the action on the outside alters. So what happens is you get released one thing at a time. And, and don't misunderstand me. Sometimes when you get saved, all of a sudden you're free from a pile of stuff. And I can't explain why some things remain or some things don't. But I think some things are a little more entrenched in you yeah. than, than others. And you just have to, you really, it's the truth of God's word. Aiming at those things is the only thing that's going to remove it from your life. Right. Willpower will not work. Right. You'll be back. But it's when you see your true identity in that location in your soul that's lying to you, and you finally believe the truth of God's word, it renews your mind, and you come out of it. Okay, so someone said to me one time, well, they said to a friend of mine, they said, how long does it take to be renewed? And he said, how long does it take to believe? And that's true. The moment you believe... That thing's dislodged. But so long as you put up with your unbelief, your true identity, and what God has truly done for you, it remains consistently in you. So I hope that helps a little bit. All right, so let's get to the main point. So the heavenly language through the Spirit has entered us, and now we have present with us a capacity to enter into communication with God which goes way, 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 way beyond the English language. I can pray about things where my mind remains unfruitful, but I pray the mysteries of God with my spirit. Now, do you understand what Paul was saying? You see, from his spirit, 
from his homeland identity. By the Spirit, he's praying the mysteries of heaven. And, and so, Dan, could you help me with this? Um, see here? Yeah. And Nate. One of you Nates come and help Dan. All right, if you pass those out. We got Nate activity here. Just make sure everybody gets one. Okay, so what I'm giving you, I'm giving you uh, seven powerful reasons for praying in tongues on one side, and then the seven covenant promises are on the other side. So I'm on the side with the seven powerful reasons for speaking in tongues. Okay? So I'm going to go through those in the scriptures so that you can see it. But I want you to know the potential... When, you, when Christ came into you, your potential, because the Spirit's in you, to speak in the heavenly language is present with you. And then you can see in the scriptures in the book of Acts how Peter and John, they started laying hands on people, and the power of God came upon them, the Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues. So in one sense, it's intrinsically in you, but in another sense, when someone releases it upon you, then it bubbles up out of you. It's like, I don't know, like I said to you a few weeks ago, it's like hitting an engine with ether. <laughs> Boom! Thing starts up. And it's like, the, when the Spirit of God and the anointing comes, yeah, oh, is that it? All right, he'll make more. Yeah. Eve knows, take hers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I <clears throat> okay, can you go with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Are you interested? Yes. I think I got your interest up. I like Bible. Don't give me that man-made stuff. Give me Bible. Right? <laughs> it seems obvious. In fact, Paul believed it so much he said, he said, I did not come to you with the wisdom of man, nor the capacity of human, but I've come to you in the power of the Spirit. So God wants us to know the word of truth, not the wisdom of man. And so the wisdom of man is actually, it goes on to say in that, that verse, is foolishness to God. So I keep warning people about um, philosophical intellectualism. I've been looking for the right words. I'm starting to get them. It's not just intellectualism, but it's philosophical intellectualism. So what that means is when you start developing doctrines off of scriptures instead of having the scriptures as your doctrine. I want scripture. I don't want philosophical intellectualism. So you have to have an intellect to memorize the scripture. That's why I have to use two words. But you understand. You get my meaning. Don't think your cleverness is what's going to get you there. A simple person can get it. Because the truth of God's word, you were made for it. You were never made for sin. Can you say, I was never made for sin? I was made for God. So you have to know, this is perfect compatibility. The old thing was imperfect. In fact, you hated it so much, you fought against sin your whole life even before you were saved. You tried not to. It didn't work because you didn't have the power. But it didn't even fit with you before you knew Christ. And you tried not to obey it. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Get the glasses out. My spirit's a new creation, but my body's not. <laughs> yeah. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning the Spirit, can I have a paper towel? I'm going to need to wipe off a spot here. Thank you. Um, now concerning the spiritual, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now does yours say concerning spiritual gifts? Cross it off. It's not in the Bible. That was an added word. This is not concerning spiritual gifts. There's no word gifts there in the Bible. That was an added thought. It's now concerning the spiritual. 
This is not about gifts particularly. This is about the spiritual conditions of things that you're going to deal with, including this. Okay? He's getting to this. And so if you nail it down to just gifts, you're going to miss the whole point. Thank you, Dan. Maybe you can just erase that. Thank you. Dan, you are such a blessing. <laughs> now, concerning the spiritual, can you say the spiritual? Brethren or brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant about the spiritual. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. Remember I, I used that word dumb a minute ago? See? It means non-speaking. Dumb is non-speaking idols. That with one, they take a log, they cut it in half. One half they carve their God, but on worship it. The other half they cook their meal. That's pretty ignorant. The God you cooked your meal with can't save you. He says, you were carried about by, away by these dumb idols. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. And he says, now, there are diversities of gifts. Now, this time, gifts is there. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God working all in all. In all. Okay, so we've got a couple things going on here. Gifts. Ministries. Was it diversities? Make sure I say the right thing. Yeah, diversities of activities. Okay. One, two, three. So these, these three things that come directly after he says, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning the spiritual. I think the reason most translators put I don't want you to be ignorant concerning the gifts is because the very first thing he starts to address is the gifts. But it wasn't about the gifts. It was about the spiritual, all three things, okay? So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about these three things. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of everybody. Okay, question. Why? Are these three things given to you or to anybody in the body of Christ? For Sorry? For the common good of the church. So you should never seek the gifts so that you could really get excited about Jesus. You should never seek the gifts because you want to prophesy over yourself. It's not about you, it's about us, it's about the others. We minister gifts to each other, okay? You minister to me, I minister to you, we minister to each other. The gifts are not for you, they're for your brother. Okay, so if you seek the gifts, you seek it for your brother. Okay, it goes on to say, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith in the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles by the same Spirit, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different ki or, or kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, and it doesn't say as he wills. That's all added. They, he, the Spirit distributes to each one individually. The Spirit doesn't have a will. The Father has a will. That's why I left it off. These are added words that give us confused about the Spirit. The Spirit does nothing of itself. The Spirit does everything according to the Father's will. Because it's His Spirit. Do you understand that? God has a Spirit. And God... He has a soul or a word. He's the word of God is his soul. That's what he thinks. That's, what he, that's where he plans. That's where he creates. But the spirit is where the power comes out and creates whatever his mind says. And so we have to understand how God operates. He's a three-faceted being. He's not three different people. He's one God, and he has a son named Jesus Christ. 
And his son is an exact replica of him, so much so he says, you see me and you've seen him. That's powerful. And so Jesus is not an example for us, but of us. We were born from the Father also in time because of what Jesus did. You are what you are because of him. You're not that way because of yourself. So you can give him credit for everything and honor him and worship him and, and celebrate him. But he is the firstborn among many sons. Right? You got that? It's important for you to understand. So if you see Jesus do something, that means you can do it. If you see Jesus do something, that means he wants you to do it. What he's done is demonstrated. He's the prototype. He's the firstborn. He's a prototype that says, I'm here to prove that my father's creation is worthy of everything he made it to be. And he came and demonstrated power over sin. He demonstrated uh, power over sickness and disease and over everything else. But the problem is we've been taught by religion that we are so much lower than Jesus, we can't possibly expect to live like he lived. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and only Jesus is not without sin. Yeah, we all did fall, but we were all delivered from sin, and this, the new nature came into us, and we've been saved from that mess. And now we should expect to live like Jesus did. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Get up, keep learning, keep growing, learn your identity, put off the thoughts of the old man, and you're going to rise, and pretty soon you're going to live like you never thought you could live. Are you with me? All right, so you got these nine gifts of the Spirit, okay? So in the gifts categories, you have nine gifts, right? One of them is tongues. Did you see it there? It was there. I read it. Okay. Read that. So then he goes on talking about that we're one body. One. And verse 18 says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. Goes on further to say, uh, verse 26, if one member suffers, all the members suffer in it. Or if one member is honored, all the members are honored with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Did you know you're a member of the body of Christ? Yes. And a member individually. But every member of the body, which he's using like a, a metaphor, is without capacity and function unless it's connected to the body. If the finger isn't connected to the body, it can't do much. If the arm isn't connected to the body, it can't do much. If the leg isn't connected to the body, it can't do much. But connected, it becomes a powerful resource of Jesus Christ. So we are the body of Christ. What? We're a physical manifestation of Christ in the earth. But we don't even see ourselves as Christ. You understand? You're kind of looking at me funny. Are you okay with that? Does that sound like too much? That's because you were taught the old way, and it's time for us to put on the new. Okay, so he goes on to say, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles. This is a chronological unfolding that happened actually in the book of Acts. You can, you can see how. So it says after that miracles. This word miracles is about, it's talking about an evangelist. The evangelist worked miracles. That was their, one of their number one ways of drawing crowds to Christ. Then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And that goes on to say, are all apostles? Answer, please. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? And do all speak in tongues? Oh, this is where people go awry. So in the, in the ministry category, you got all these ministries And one of them is tongues. So you got to understand, in the gifts category, there's tongues. But in the ministry category, there's tongues also. And these two are not the same. Do all speak in tongues with an interpretation? No. Do all have the tongue of ministry? That means you speak in a tongue and everybody understands you in their own language? Or you even speak in another language because the Spirit's in you and you all of a sudden you communicate in their language. Not everybody has that. But then there's this one. 
Now remember, this is all happening chronologically because Paul was teaching chronologically. So he goes on through and he starts talking about in chapter 13. And he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. You see? You see that? Remember I had a list of the natural tongues? Though I speak with the tongue of men or the tongue of Elohim. That's the word in the original. Uh, this is a quote from the Old Testament. And the word Elohim is the one used for angels or God. So Elohim means angels of God. So though I speak in the tongue of Elohim, of God and angels, or of man, and I don't have love, I'm nothing. So he's saying, all right, you can get all this stuff going on, but if you don't have love, it doesn't even mean anything. So we've got to get that straight. God's bottom line, I don't want to correct everything. I don't, I just, I don't want to confuse you, but it's not really love if you don't have agape. And I contend with this issue a lot, but I don't even think agape is love. I think that's a misinterpretation. Everything I'm studying in the lexicons about agape is actually unconditional commitment. If, if you speak in the tongues of men or in the tongues of angels and you are unconditionally committed to each other in the body of Christ, you have nothing. Do you know what we mostly have in the church? No unconditional commitment. And one of the things we have attempted to do in this church is to alter that. We have really set forth in our hearts. And one way we're doing it, we've dethroned a one-man show. It's not about a man other than the man Jesus. And we've put a team of pastors in place of that so that we're not worshiping an individual or saying, well, what does he say? It's not about him, it's about Jesus. It's about his word, because he is the word of the Father. And so we've, we've got rid of that. We've also elevated the value of every person in our speech and in our judgment in our heart to say there's nobody above anybody else. So if you have something to say, we don't have a right to say, just follow me, just be quiet. We don't have that communication. Your word is as valuable as our word, uh, you might not be in charge of the meeting because God didn't give you that part because you're the finger and I'm the mouth <laughs> or someone else says, you understand, you got to know what your part is, but you're, you're just as valuable as anybody else. So we've tried to dethrone that and remove that to what? Create value in God's people so they can see how valuable you are. But if you think the pastor is the only one that can have success, then I'll take you to his house and we'll go through his sock drawer and we'll go, through, in, in a sense, we'll dig into his life, and I'll show you problems are in, in pastors' lives. And they aren't the perfect people you think they are. And the reason you go to Bible college and they teach you don't ever have someone at your house because they don't want you to see them in their natural state messing up. So we, we have to protect ourselves from people seeing into our lives because our lives are so much of a mess. But God delivered us from all that so that we could say, come follow me, come into my life, and look at my sock drawer. <laughs> now, if you go in there, Marge will kill you, but I, I, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you in. Okay. <laughs> and not only that, but miracles happen in that drawer. It never goes empty. I'm just amazed every time I open it. There's more socks. I mean, it's been, it's been 44 years. That thing's full. <laughs> All right, so we should be looking next for this one. Diversities. Because chronologically, it's the next one. So he talks all about love in chapter 13. And I'll, I want to catch this one verse. Is it eight? Oh, my. No, well, I do have to worry about it. I'll be in trouble. The last thing Bart said to me, now make sure you're done by eight. <laughs> so I want to show you the last one. Look at chapter 14, because he goes through a whole bunch of things, and he's talking all about the thing. In verse 14, verse 1, he says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy. So you see where it says desire spiritual gifts? That word gifts is not there. Pursue unconditional commitment and desire spiritual. The spiritual. 
All of it. Not just this. And that's why I've separated it so you can see what it actually used to say. But especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in tongues, all right, you got your list? Here's number one. I would suggest you write right in your Bible right here. Verse two is number one. He who speaks in tongues does not speak to men but to God. So next to it, I put a little description of what that means. Speaking in tongues gives us direct communication between our spirit and God's. Do you know how sometimes you're, you're confused, things are going on in your life, you don't know how to pray? You can just start praying in tongues. And you're speaking directly with God. Your brain is pushed to the side. And your intellect is out of the way so that your spirit man can begin to commune with God. And I've noticed, you'll see on the rest of this list how it works. The power of God starts to operate within your soul. You start understanding things you couldn't understand five minutes ago. Okay, so he says, so speaking in tongues gives us direct communication with our spirit and God's. Number two, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Okay, that's the second half of the verse. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Speaking in tongues brings the secrets of God's spirit into ours. Think of that. So something's hidden from you, and you start praying, oh, shakan, da, da, ma, ku, zu, gudia. What I like to do when I pray in tongues, I like to kind of visualize the angels and God. Misiki, sakata, robo, seke. I'm speaking in the heavenly language. Come on, Alex, give me an amen. When you're talking in your language, man, they understand you. And when I'm talking in my home language, they all understand me. And the more I pray it, pretty soon the power of that starts coming down on me. It's almost like a waterfall of knowledge starts hitting me. Whatever I'm praying about starts coming into my heart. Do you get it? So speaking in tongues brings the secrets of God's spirit into ours. Number three, he who speaks in tongues edifies himself. So the word edify in the Greek means to build up. Speaking in tongues edifies and leads towards building spiritual strength. When I feel very weak and don't know what to do, and I don't know what to preach, or I don't know what's next, I don't know what to do about an investment or something, start praying in the homeland language. Amen. I'm telling you, there's something. You just start praying. If you get linked in, locked in, quick, just get past the unbelief and just stand there. And no, God's hearing you. The angels are hearing. And you get linked in. It doesn't take long. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I know what to do. Right. It just comes. Absolutely. It is one of the best gifts you could ever have. Yeah. If you want to prophesy, it's a prerequisite for prophecy. It brings the secrets of God into your heart. Speaking in tongues edifies. Okay, number four. I desire that you speak in tongues in order that you might prophesy. Do you hear that? This is something I learned uh, by studying the Greek. Um, <clears throat> verse 5 says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. That is not what it says in the Greek. No. It does not say even more. This is what it says. I desire you all to speak with tongues in order that you might prophesy. That's totally different. In order. So if I'm going to go to a prophetic conference or somewhere, <clears throat> and I know I'm going to be called upon for the prophetic, man, I'm going to be praying in tongues. I don't even have to think about anything. Don't even worry about the scriptures. I'd start praying in tongues for the next hour, and I tell you what, I'll walk in and I'll start prophesying over anybody I put my eyes on. It just is a resource built up inside of you. You build the strength of heaven, and the more you walk in this, the easier and easier it gets. Pray in tongues in order to prophesy. I challenge you, pray in tongues one hour a day and show up next Sunday and see what happens. <laughs> We're like, man, somebody turned down the volume. <laughs> you, know, you know, you'll be like, Whoa. we're coming out of you. You can't even help it. It starts taking over. Is that good? Yeah. All right, so verse 14. It says, uh, For if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my <clears throat> understanding is unfruitful. Isn't that wonderful? There's something I love about this. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit with my spirit, but my understanding is unfruitful. You know, 
One of the nicest things you can ever do for yourself is tell your mind to shut up. <laughs> Take a break. I'm a spirit man. I'm just not an English-speaking man. I'm a spirit man. I can communicate. And you get feisty about it, too. And it gets fun. Because you're bypassing your limited understanding. So he says, praying in tongues bypasses my own limited understanding to pray directly from my spirit. Isn't that good news? Okay, the next one, verse 15, it says, what must be done? Yours might say it differently. I've retranslated it. What must be done? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Wow. Think of that. Praying in tongues promotes understanding and brings about confidence. Do you see that? What's to be done? I'll pray in the Spirit, and I'll pray with my understanding. Why? Because the secrets of God are being revealed to me. Now I can use my understanding and pray to God concerning what I've seen. Anybody hear it? So important. Last one. This is... Uh, in the second half of that verse 15, it says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So singing in tongues promotes a higher form of worship. You know what worship is? Putting everything beneath him. Or raising him above everything. And so when you spring, sometimes I, I, we get in a prayer meeting and they'll say, Start, all right, let's sing to the Lord. Uh, I'm not the best singer. And so, but if I start singing in tongues, you don't know when I'm making a mistake. <laughs> so I just start singing in tongues. And it's amazing to me, after a little while, I get traction. A tune comes. I start to worship God. And I'll start singing in the spirit. And I get flooded with emotion from heaven. It is so important in your life. So I have a suggestion for you. You run into a trial. You run into a problem. Something's going wrong in your life. The bill's too big. Whatever. Pick it up and start singing in the spirit. Dancing through your house. Singing to God. Not for God to answer the need, but to tell him you're above this. And put it below you, singing in the spirit. And I'm telling you, words in your own language will start boiling out of your lips. And you'll start giving thanks to God that he created you far above in victory, above any challenge that will come against you. Is this important? So, so he's talking about speaking in tongues. So the diversity of tongues, what he said, I desire... You all to speak in tongues. So this diversity of tongues is leading to, it's leading to all kinds of activity in the spirit. So you, you, it's really important to understand, when you speak in tongues in the diversity, everybody can speak in tongues. Not everybody has this tongues, and not everybody has that tongues. But everybody, when they're filled with the Spirit, can speak in tongues. In fact, you can see in the book of Acts, it says, it says, the Spirit fell upon all of them that were in the room, and they all spoke with tongues. Right. It's the heavenly language. Then you can read in Acts 19, how that they prayed for them, and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they all spoke with other tongues. And so I see the reaction of when people get the diversity of tongues, all of them speak in tongues but you'll never find it in this area. It's always diverse. And we said, uh, was it last Wednesday night? And that word came to me. I was sitting there, and it was an answer to Katrina's question. I didn't know she asked a question. And it was, uh, the answer was this, that I heard in the Spirit. And I knew it, but it came to me. And the Lord said um, that, what in the world am I talking about? <laughs> Katrina's question. What was that, the gift? Yeah, all right. So what was the best gift? And I was saying how the Lord was showing me that it's the gift that's needed. But also the Lord had shown me that the, the Spirit is distributing severally as the Spirit wills, according to God's will, it's being given out, right? But that doesn't mean you can't tap into it because the fullness of the Spirit moved into you, not part of the Spirit. Okay, so you have to realize 
Like again, that's where I use the example of ether. You're going, and it stalls out. And, it stalls out. and you hit it with ether. And the engine starts. And that's like the gifts that the Holy Spirit hitting the body with that one with this, and that one with this, and that one with this, and that one with that. And it peppers the church with these gifts, which stimulates spirituality in the church, and then the motor starts going. You understand? People get excited. People get moving in their gifts. And then once you do, you start discovering the capacity of the Spirit to release anything you believe for within you. Right. It's just something to get you going. It's not the end product. Of His fullness... We have all received. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So I encourage you, uh, go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. I'm not going there now. And you can read about the seven covenant promises that God made to Abraham. They're on the back of that. And uh, remember, if you are Christ's, this is Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. And this is the promise to Abraham and to his seed, who I am. So Abraham, I'm not a Jewish seed. I'm a believer seed. Abraham wasn't a Jew. Right. Oh. Oh. Pastor Chris, you didn't say that. Of course he was. No, he wasn't. Jacob was the first Jew. That was his grandson. Old grandpa started something. <laughs> and then God took over in Jacob. It caused the nation of Israel to be born. But Abraham's the father of faith, yeah. right. not Jacob. Right. And we are born of that seed, the faith of our father. We are, and this is our seven covenant promises, so I encourage you to get that. <laughs>